Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel and please do not forget to share it with everyone. I will be posting sermons every week that will inspire you and help you to live closer to God. Let us pray as we open God's word. Gracious Father, as we open your word, open our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> This week uh, and next week I will do a short series of two sermons on the topic how to practice the second greatest commandment in our lives. How to practice the second greatest commandment in our lives. Now the whole Bible is summarized into two commandments. Jesus when he was asked what are the great commandments he did summarize the whole law <coughs> into two commandments love God and love your fellow men <coughs> sorry so the well it in may in most cases loving God is so easy to most of us but when it comes to loving one another that's where sometimes we falter that's where we sometimes struggle so this week and next week I will concentrate on how we can practice <coughs> the second greatest commandment in our lives for today I will talk about part one which is 10 ways to love one another 10 ways to love one another you know as I said well, Matthew 22 36 to 40 Jesus speaking about the law he says some one the teacher comes to him uh, lawyer comes to him and says teacher which is the great commandment in the law Jesus said to him you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind <clears throat> this is the first and great commandment and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets so loving God and loving your neighbor or loving your fellow man are the two great commandments the question is can I love God and not love others is it possible that I can love God but I don't like to love others. Another question is, can I love others and not love God? God, Jesus is showing a connection between loving God and loving fellow men. We need to understand this. Love one another in the Bible. There's so many times love one another is mentioned in the Bible. Someone said it is used more than around 100 times in the Bible. 94 times it is used in the New Testament. And one third of them deal with church getting along. One third of them instruct Christians to love one another. 60% of those instructions come from Paul's epistles. And out of them, four of them talks about uh, a holy kiss, where Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. <clears throat> so 10 things we should be to one another. 10 things to love one another this week. What are they? Number one, love one another. The, begin, the, the first one that we all must remember is to love one another. You know, in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. No, one of the greatest tragedies of Christianity today is we are not able to proclaim the gospel to the whole world as effectively as the early church did. You know why? It's not that the gospel has lost its power. It's not that we are not preaching the gospel. The main problem is <clears throat> Christians who claim to be the followers of Jesus are not following the ways of God. I say something, I do something. Look at the first early church. They said they had everything in common. They met together for worship, for sharing, for caring. They sold all that they have. There was love exhibited. There was love demonstrated in what they spoke and what they did. But today it's not happening. Therefore, our testimony, our witness is not affected because people are hearing the truth from our mouths, but they're not seeing that being practiced in our lives. As a result, our testimony is becoming um, um, uh, not of any value to them. So that's why it says, if you love me, keep my 
commandments and it says by this all will know that you are my disciple if you love one another the only way the world will know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ is not by preaching or teaching or reading Bible but according to Jesus it is by loving one another I want you to examine your own life and see how much do I love people do I really love people or do I only love people that love me what kind of love do I have towards people that are around me or outside of me we need to ask this question when we genuinely love one another it is an indication that we are the children of God more so God Jesus says you will be known as my disciples if you love one another first John 4 20 says if someone says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love <clears throat> his brother whom he can see how can he love God whom he cannot see you see how the connection goes John the beloved is saying how can I say I love God and I don't love my fellow being he's saying how is it possible that you love a God whom you never saw but you can't love a person whom you see therefore he says if you say you love God and hate your brother you are a liar how many of us hate one another no matter what the reason may be no matter what the problem might be if there was if there is a hatred in our lives for one another in spite of the circumstances and but yet you say I love God according to John the beloved we are liars we're telling a lie so the first thing I would like all of us to remember when it comes to loving one another or 10 ways to love one another is first one is love one another genuinely for who they are show your love that's the only way they will know that you are a child of God that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ the second is pray for one another the first one love one another the second one pray for one another look at James 5 16 where he says confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much here James is advising us that we need to pray for one another so that our prayers can have effect you know many a times all somewhat sometimes not many a times sometimes most of our prayers are only selfish prayers it's all about me even if I'm praying for others 90% of the prayers is about me maybe 10% about others that is a very selfish prayer God already knows what I want we need to intercede for each other. We need to plead on behalf of those who need our prayers. That should be our priority when we come to God in prayer. Also in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence so through Paul again we have an admission that we need to pray for all men we need to pray for the poor we need to pray for the sick we need to pray for the rich we need to pray for all kinds of people we need to pray for those who are caught in sin we need to pray for those who are spreading the gospel we need to pray for our politicians we need to pray for our leaders we need to pray for our teachers we need to pray for our preachers we need to pray for everyone I remember when I was doing my training as a pastor in India <clears throat> one of the missionary came from uh, United States and uh, he asked me to take him to a town so I took him to town for shopping and uh, on the high street as we were walking he would stop at every shop he would stop at every place spend few moments and continue and I was wondering what is he doing here why is he wasting his time why can't he walk fast so after some time I became so restless I did actually ask him sir what's happening why are you stopping for a long time when you're not even buying anything and this is what he told me Mohan you know what I'm praying for all of them I'm praying for this shop I'm praying for those people who are sitting there I'm praying for those people who are in that building or in that house I said why you don't know them look I may not come to this high street again I may not pass this by again but I have an opportunity that whatever I can see whomever I can see I can at least pray for them well that really shocked me as Christians we are called to pray for one another that is an amazing way of living our lives as you 
travel, as you walk around, as you meet people, send a prayer to God. You may never meet them again, but your prayers will always be ascending to God's throne. And who knows when and how the prayer will be answered and that person will be blessed. So the second thing that we need to do for one another is pray for one another. That should be always in our hearts and minds. The third thing that we need to do is confess to one another. Look at again James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. If we have wronged one another, if there is something that's bothering me, that's making me feel guilty, there's no point of keeping it to ourselves. Let's talk to each other. Let's confess to each other. Confession does not simply mean that you made a, you did you did something wrong and that you are confessing. It also means that you are, something is bothering you that you want to talk it out. That's one of the way to get rid of whatever it is. So either your sins or something else that's bothering you, speak to one another so that you can find some comfort. So that's why confess your trespasses to one another. And again, 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Christianity, when it comes to the forgiveness of sins, there's two things that must happen. One is repentance. Repentance is feeling sorry for what you have done. Second is confession. There's no point of just feeling sorry for what you have done when you are not confessing your sins. There's two ways to confess your sins. If you have sinned against God, confess it to God. If you have sinned against your fellow men, confess to them first. Jesus clearly told us, before you come to me with your offering or sacrifice, leave it there, go to your brother, say sorry, confess your sin, come and then offer a sacrifice to me. That's the best way to confess. How sometimes we do? Well, I don't want to go to him. I don't want to go to her. Why should I? It is their fault. It is their mistake. If I go, they'll think low of me. No. So, but rather we would go to God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I hurt him. I hurt her. Forgive me. No, that's not the way. That's not the procedure. To that person first. That's why confession is important. Say sorry. You don't have to confess to the whole world, neither to your pastor, but to the person whom you have wronged or who have wronged, you have, a, you have a responsibility to go and make things right even before you could go to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me. So we need to, you know, only the courageous people, only the brave people will have, we are, will be able to go and say sorry. If you're weak, you struggle to say, I'm so sorry. So the third, the third, the, four, the fourth one I would like to leave is, uh, confess to one another. The third one, sorry. The fourth one is forgive one another. Forgive one another. It says, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. What does it say? Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Why should I forgive others? Sometimes we think, why should I forgive him? Why should I forgive her? They don't deserve forgiveness. The way they hurt me, they don't even deserve. In fact, they don't even ask me sorry. So why should I forgive? This is how, this is how sometimes we will react to the pain that we are going through or to the hurt that we are going through. Remember what the scripture says, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave. Do you deserve forgiveness? How many times you keep doing the same again and again? And how many times does God forgive you? Endless times. So why, why, why do we struggle to forgive somebody who has hurt us? Therefore, the fourth thing that we need to do is what? Forgive one another. For your own peace, for their, own, for their peace, and for a right relationship with God, forgive one another. Also, it says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you... Forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It is shocking. It is almost saying that if you don't forgive your brother or your sister, your friend, your neighbor, your spouse, your children, you have no right to ask God even for forgiveness. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Forgive our debts as we forgive those who sinned against us. Forgive my sins or forgive my trespasses. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. In other words, how I'm forgiving others, Lord, please forgive my sins as well. 
that's what Jesus is again referring here. If you do not forgive others, uh, forgive their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. It's not like it's a condition that you have to, but if you really desire God to forgive your sins, you need to have the same kind of desire to forgive other sins. Otherwise, it's a selfish life. You want God to forgive your sins, but you don't want to forgive your fellow men. What kind of love is that, he says. So the fourth one is forgive one another. The fifth one, bear one another's burdens. What does it mean? Look at what Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The way to fulfill the law of Christ is to bear one another burdens. And also Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 or 3 says, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, hearing with one another in love, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, with long suffering, with gentleness, bear one another's burdens. How do we do it? Brethren, look at verse Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. How do you bear one another's burdens? People are carrying so many burdens. And if they come and share some burden, as much as within your power, bear it by listening, by giving an advice, by giving a helping hand, doing whatever you can within the power that you have so that they can feel a bit light of the burden that they are carrying. Sometimes we think, I have got so many burdens, I can't help you out. No, the best way to lighten your own burden is to help others carry their burden. Sometimes when you hear their burdens, you feel, wow, I'm not suffering that much. I thank God. Your own burden is lighted when you experience carrying others' burdens. So the Bible says one of the ways to love others and to show that love is to carry one another's burdens. Whatever the burden they have, within the power that you have, within the means you have, within the time you have, do your best to carry their burden so that they will feel lighted and you also feel your burden is lighted. So that is the fifth one. The sixth one, be kind to one another. Look at what Ephesians 4.32 says. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What does it say? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. You know, kindness is one language that, uh, that, that breaks all barriers. Kindness is a language that somebody said that dumb can hear and the deaf. So the dumb can speak and the deaf can hear. That's the kind of language kindness is. So what does the Bible say? Be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted. We have one life. We have one life. Let's make use of this life to be kind to one another. If there's one thing that anybody would like to remember about you is your kindness. How you treated them, how you dealt with them, how you spoke with them, how you have stood by them in their time of need. When the Bible says there's only one thing that we, that he goes with us when we get to heaven is our character, how we lived on this earth. Our good works follow. Kindness is a language that everybody understands. It crosses all cultures. So we have a responsibility to be kind. If we, uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. That's one way of being kind. How can I be kind? If only you're looking at your own interest, your own needs, you're only worried about your own world, your own circle, that's not being kind. Ephesians 2 4 says, don't look at your own interests, look into the interests of others. What can I do for him? What can I do for her? How can, be a, how can I be a blessing? How can I extend my helping hand to them? If these are the thoughts that are in your mind and when you see people, if this is what goes into your mind, there is something that you can do. And that goes for a long time. Kindness is a language that everybody understands. But do you have a heart to be kind to one another? That's what is. So, but look at another verse, Luke 6.35. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind 
to the unthankful and evil. Who is kind to the unthankful and evil? God. God sends rain on the wicked and the righteous. God sends sunshine on the wicked and the righteous. God takes care of everyone irrespective of their relationship with him. So God is saying if God is so thank God is so kind to the unthankful and the evil, he is expecting his followers, his disciples also to be kind to the unthankful and the evil. Sometimes we are so selfish. You help me, I help you. You invite me to your party, I invite you to your party. You give me gifts, I give you gifts. But those who we do not know, those whom we don't like, we don't even want to see their face. That's not being kind. Bible says God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. So he's asking his disciples, you also be kind even to the unthankful and the evil people. You may, They may have hurt you, but if you see the need, help them. You don't say, well, I will not because of what you have done. That's not Christ-like. That's not a Christian. So be ye kind to one another. The seventh is esteem others better than yourself. Esteem others better than yourself. Look at what Philippians 2.3 says. Let nothing be done through strife, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. How do I do it? How can I think you're better than me? Every, does this mean that everybody that you see around you say, well, you're better than me, you're better than me, I'm nothing? Is that the kind of attitude the Bible is saying? No. When the Bible says, esteem others better than yourself, it's saying, make sure that you value everyone. Sometimes we put people down by their looks, by their color, by their race, by their nationality, by their profession, by the way they do things. We think they are lower than us or they don't, they don't deserve to be in my circle, whatever the circumstances. If you want to love one another sincerely and keep that second commandment to what it means, the seventh thing that Bible is talking about is esteem them as better than yourself. It simply means value them. They may be black, they may be white, they may be brown, they may be poor, they may be smelling, they may be not looking good, they may be struggling, they may be whatever it could be. When you see their face, give value to them. They are human beings. Remember a story of Mother Teresa. Once she was going in the train in India and she was, uh, uh, she was booked her ticket into an AC compartment but she chose to go in a third class compartment where poor people sit. Uh, so her, her colleagues, uh, her people said, what do you want to travel? It's a long journey. Why can't you sit here and have comfortable journey? She said, no, I would love to go with those poor people. She sat with them and one of them asked, why do you do this? She said, in the face of every suffering child, I see the face of Jesus. She said, in the face of every suffering child, I see the face of Jesus. So when she sees a leper, stinking, pus coming out, flies all around him, according to her, she is not seeing that stinking person, that dirty person, that sickly person. She is seeing the face of Jesus. And when she sees the face of Jesus, she is able to embrace, hug, treat. That is what it means to esteem, give a worth to a fellow being. They may not deserve it, but they are because they are the children of God. In the sight of God, that person and you are the same. So God expects us to treat them the same. Sometimes we do, we keep distance from certain people. But this is saying esteem one another. That means value everybody. Everybody are precious in the sight of God. No color, race or anything of that sight is uh, superior. We must treat everyone as precious people irrespective of who they are and what their social status is. The eighth one, it says, live in peace with one another. What is it? Live in peace with one another. Look at Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. If it is possible, as, mu as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 18. And from Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Look at these wonderful words in the Bible. What does it say? Pursue peace with all people. Some of us have no peace. 
neither do we allow others to live in peace. Every time we meet somebody, we are always arguing, we are always fighting. We don't want to give up. We don't go to make peace with each other. The scripture says, make peace with all men, without which no one will see the Lord, it says, Hebrews 12, 14. They may not be for peace, but at least you make peace. Your intention must be, I am here to make peace with you. They may not like it. They may not agree with you. That's okay. That is out of your control. But you must make peace. And then 12, Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, that means it may be sometimes not possible to make peace because the way they behave. But as much as within your power, make peace with people. As much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. What are, people, what are you known for in the community, in your own home? Are you a quarrelsome person? Do you make peace or do you make war? Or do you cause trouble? What does people think of you? What does people remember of you? Or here comes a woman, here comes a man who is always for peace. Or will they say, here comes a woman, here comes a man who always wants to pick up a fight, who is always arguing for something, who always wants to say they are right. Bible is, if you want to follow the second greatest commandment, live in peace, make peace with everyone as much as possible from you. And Matthew 5.19, one of the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. If you want to be called a child of God, it says you need to make peace with one another. The ninth one, stir up one another. Look at Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. In other words, whenever you meet people, you need to stir them up. You need to encourage them. You need to motivate them to good works for love. In other words, every time you meet some people, what can we do to help somebody? What can we do to love each other? What can we do to do some good thing for somebody? That's the kind of uh, conversation that must be surrounded. You know, somebody said when two people meet together, the conversation is all about, uh, mostly all about the third person. Have you heard? She is like that. He is like that. Did you know this? Did you know that? That is all rubbish. According to scriptures, whenever we meet together, we need to stir up. Sometimes we are discouraged. Sometimes we don't know. Let's do together. Don't worry. I am there for you. Let's work it out. Look, what can we do to, to somebody to help? That's what Hebrews 10, 24 says. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That should be our motive when we gather together. So, stir up one another. And last one, tenth one. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns and songs. Look at Ephesians 5, 19 to 21. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. What does he say? Every time you meet with somebody, not only do you stir up one another for love and good works, express your love and gratitude to God in psalms and hymns. We need to be showing, sharing our testimony, singing praises unto God. Now, if you're, in, if you're in the company of people who love, who are for good things, who are praising God, that's the most joyful company that you can have. So every time you meet with people, share your testimony. Send a praise to God to above heaven. Sing songs together. Pray together. How, how nice the life would be. You don't have to go to heaven to experience that atmosphere. If you have these attitudes, you can experience heaven in your own home, in your own community, in your own church. So these 10 things are the things that I would suggest that we do to one another so that we practice the, com the second commandment, the second greatest commandment, love one another. Next week, we will go through the second part of this commandment where seven things I will tell you that we should not do for one another. Today I shared with you ten things that we must do for one another. Next week I'll share with you seven things that we should not do to one another. May the Lord help us to be to, to practice these ten principles that will that so that we can love one another genuinely. God bless you all.